When it opened, Smith Reynolds Airport in Winston-Salem was hailed as one of the finest airports in the country. Over the years, it has accommodated heroes, presidents, and stars. Its facilities helped defeat the Axis during World War II and later welcomed home America's soldiers, sailors, and airmen. Today, Smith Reynolds Airport appears a quaint throwback, a living artifact of an earlier era in aviation, when DC-3s traced contrails in the sky and passengers dressed as if they were going to church. But the airport is more. It is a tangible link to Winston-Salem's proud heritage as one of the pioneers in municipal aviation in North Carolina. This is the story of how a few far-sighted and determined civic leaders work together to give Winston-Salem the best airport in North Carolina, and how that airport fell victim to the larger forces that came to shape commercial aviation. years ago, as the Wright brothers were making their first flights at Kitty Hawk, Winston was coming of age. Spurred by tobacco and other manufacturing, the city was rapidly growing. In 1913, it would merge with Salem and soon be the largest city in North Carolina. As the state's leading city, Winston-Salem was at the forefront in pursuing this new form of transportation. The city hosted its first air show in 1911, and by 1920, the city had two landing strips. The larger of the two was east of town on Kernersville Road. It was named Maynard Field in honor of Belvin Maynard, a World War I ace, North Carolina native, and ordained Baptist minister known as the Flying Parson. Neither field amounted to much. Maynard Field was described as, at best, a cow pasture, a windsock, and a name. By the early 1920s, city leaders were looking for a new airfield. So were Greensboro and High Point. The three cities joined forces to search for a new site that could serve them all. Paul Lindley's farm in the friendship community between Colfax and Greensboro was picked, but it quickly became clear to Winston-Salem business leaders that the location was too far away to be practical. In 1927, the Chamber of Commerce formed a committee to search for a new site. They were still considering their options when a young pilot from the Midwest climbed into his cockpit for a feat that would change aviation forever, and with it, the city's plan for a new airport. This is a tale of courage and pluck and the do or die spirit of youth. It reads very much like fiction, but the strange part of all is the truth. For a slim blonde lad of 25 with a faith in his aeroplane decided to fly from New York to Paris. A great many thought him in pain. Well, in May of 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew nonstop from New York to Paris. And that just electrified the whole world. Today, it's, it's, it's a little difficult to really understand the impact that Lindbergh had when you start looking at the, say, the popular culture, the, the, the sheet music that was immediately generated, the, all the ephemera, the, the souvenirs. And I've even talked to a couple of older pilots who so felt the influence impact and the impact that Lindbergh had that they decided, they consciously decided to go into aviation. And then when he returned back to the United States, he began planning a tour of the nation that fall. And uh, it was announced that he would include Winston-Salem on that tour. The Chambers Airport Committee had identified this property, the Forsyth County Farm, as a potential site of the new airport. Finding a site that was large enough had not been easy on the rolling terrain of the North Carolina Piedmont. The county farm, a home for delinquent youth, 
offered the added advantage of being just 10 minutes north of downtown. It also sat on high ground in the county. The chamber was discussing the issue with James Gray, the chairman of the county commissioners, when news came of Lindbergh's visit. And so that really was an impetus for Winston-Salem leaders to go ahead and complete plans for a new airport. Winston-Salem's long entertained dream of a municipal airport is about to become a reality. The city is to have a landing field, modern in every respect on Forsyth County property on the Walkertown Road. No expense is to be spared in preparing the site or equipping the airport, which is expected to be one of the best in the country. The 90-acre farm was leased from the county, and workers began grading it for the new airport. To make the 1,600-foot runway, the crown of a hill was cleared off and used to fill the surrounding low ground. Machinery and labor were borrowed from the Forsyth County Highway Commission. As the new field took shape, a local businessman named Clinton Miller got caught up in the growing excitement. He gave $17,000 to equip the airport with a hangar and lights. In gratitude, the newly formed airport commission voted to name the new airport Miller Municipal Airport. Even as grading was still underway, congratulatory telegrams poured in from Boston, Denver, San Diego, and Kansas. Lindbergh's landing here on October 14, 1927, marked the official opening of the new airport. The aviation hero was greeted by North Carolina Governor Angus McLean and Mayor Thomas Barber as he stepped from the spirit of St. Louis. That night, Lindbergh was honored at a banquet at the Robert E. Lee Hotel. In a surprise announcement, the guest learned that R. E. Lassiter, another local businessman, was putting up $100,000 to buy the airport land and give it to the airport commission. Lindbergh would leave town the next day, bound for another city, but Winston-Salem had its airport. Interest in aviation was becoming a national obsession. Edsel Ford, the son of automobile maker Henry Ford, sponsored a series of national air tours that captured the public imagination. Up to 30 airplanes flew from city to city across the country, promoting the safety and reliability of aviation. With the opening of Miller Municipal Airport, Winston-Salem was added to the 1929 National Air Tour. With all arrangements and plans practically completed, Winston-Salem awaits the coming of the Ford National Air Tour Thursday morning. The largest crowd ever assembled at Miller Municipal Airport, even exceeding that which saw Lindbergh land, is expected to be on hand to beat the largest fleet of planes that ever came to North Carolina. Locally, Richard J. Reynolds Jr., son of the tobacco magnate, started Reynolds Aviation, one of the nation's early commercial air services. Dick at the age of 21, rescued Curtis Field from demolition. It was already a famous field uh, where a lot had happened there. He purchased the field, took leases on three other fields, uh, started Reynolds Airways, and was vying for airmail routes, competing against uh, a man named Eddie Rickenbacker. And he had several planes, he did charters, uh, he gave flight instructions, and uh, so he had a, a nice little business there. And in the meantime, when people in Winston-Salem started organizing Miller Municipal Airport, they encouraged Dick Reynolds to become involved, and he did. He um, moved some of his company to Winston-Salem, and, and that was very important for that early development of, of the Winston-Salem Airport. In 1930, Reynolds Aviation started offering passenger flights to the beach. For those who could afford the fare, the promise of quick public transportation by air was now a reality. They could leave town on Friday evening, spend the weekend at the beach, and be back in the office first thing Monday morning. However, by 1932, Dick Reynolds was ready to move on to other ventures. He financed the sale of Reynolds Aviation to his friend and former employee, Lewis Mac McGinnis. McGinnis, one of the mechanics who had helped pre-flight the Spirit of St. Louis before Lindbergh took off for Paris, worked at Reynolds' base at Curtis Field. 
Later, McGinnis had moved south to run Reynolds' operation in Winston-Salem. McGinnis renamed the business Camel City Flying Service. He discontinued Reynolds' regular flights to other cities and concentrated on aircraft sales and repair. The airport had grown. Reynolds Aviation had built a second steel hangar at the airport, and a small white frame house had been built to serve as an airport office. The house would become a fixture at the airport. Charles Norfleet, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce Airport Committee, years later would write, This little building, for so long an integral part of field operations that airport employees regarded almost with superstition and refused to see it demolished, is still in use after having served as office, administration building, waiting room, and classroom. It has just undergone its fourth removal to a new spot on the edge of the field and will be used henceforth for the unromantic business of tool storage. In 1927, the airport had been praised as one of the nation's best, but by the mid-1930s, driven by rapid improvements in aircraft, Miller Municipal Airport was in danger of becoming obsolete. To keep up with the times, the airport was expanded. Through the North Carolina Emergency Relief Administration, a group of men went to work with picks, shovels, and wheelbarrows. The two runways were expanded to 40 feet wide and up to 2,200 feet long. With the runways expanded, Eastern Airlines offered to move its regular service to Winston-Salem from Greensboro's Lindley Field while that airport was undergoing its own improvements. Overnight, the city raised $4,500 to pay for the lighting system needed for commercial airline service. In 1937, crowds gathered at the airport to mark its 10th anniversary. An air show was held to celebrate the occasion. It was captured on film by a member of the Norfleet family. By the late 1930s, the airport was in need of expansion again. After the previous expansion, Winston-Salem had enjoyed regular air service with Eastern Airlines for eight months. But then, Eastern started flying the larger DC-2 aircraft, which required even longer runways. The airline returned to Lindley Field, and Winston was again without regular air service. New plans were hatched to expand the airport again. This time, city leaders were determined to come up with an airport that would again make Winston-Salem the leader in North Carolina aviation. In the 1850s, Winston-Salem found itself on the periphery as railroads revolutionized transportation and commerce. The city had to fight hard to secure adequate rail service. The men who were planning the improvements to Miller Field remembered the city's struggle for the railroad. They were determined that this time, the city would be on the main line of America's air transportation system. Clearly, the airport needed to have regular commercial air service. This would require longer runways and better facilities. An expansion plan was put together. It called for lengthening the existing runways and adding two more, installing a new lighting system and putting up a new passenger terminal and administration building. Dick Reynolds and Charles Norfleet began discussions with Eastern Airlines. Reynolds, still one of Winston-Salem's leading aviation supporters, was determined that the city have regular air service. Money for the project was made available through the Works Progress Administration. However, the WPA alone could not give Winston-Salem the kind of airport that would put it ahead of the competition another source of money was needed. Again, Dick Reynolds took the lead. With the support of his sisters, he committed to using the Reynolds fortune to finance the new terminal with the understanding that the airport would be renamed after his late brother, Z. Smith Reynolds. 
In 1932, Smith Reynolds was killed by a gunshot under mysterious circumstances. His death at the age of 21 had ended a promising career in aviation. All the Reynolds children seemed to have an interest in aviation, even though Nancy never got her pilot's license. She seemed to enjoy telling stories about uh, the, the early uh, uh, experiences that the, that the other three had in aviation. Uh, there's a, a photo that has been uh, widely circulated, taken in 1920, of a, of a pair of famous barnstormers, Turner and Runcer. Obviously, they were invited uh, sometimes we like to think that maybe this was the, the start of uh, interest in aviation for the children. By the time Smith was 15, uh, he was going up to Curtis Field in the summers when Woodbury Forest would let out for the summer. He would go up to Curtis Field, take flying lessons with Mac McGinnis, and uh, soon he pretty much decided that he wanted a career in aviation. In 1930, at the age of 19, Smith Reynolds decided on a whim to fly from New York to Los Angeles. He completed the flight in 28 hours and five minutes, well under the record of 34 hours and three minutes. I think it was a real demonstration of Smith's skill as a pilot that he was able to make that record-setting flight from New York to Los Angeles. However, it was a shame that he hadn't made arrangements ahead of time because he had no timer and it could never be an official record just based on his having done it. He followed this feat with a solo flight from London to China. The 17,000-mile trip took four months. Along the way, Reynolds had to fly through sandstorms, dense fog, and deserts. On one leg, he flew several hundred miles over water with a faulty compass. He made landfall exactly on course. Pilots who've read his log and know a bit about, particularly about his Savoia Marchetti amphibian that he took on his flight from London to China, uh, say he had to be a good pilot to be able to handle that plane. He had to be a good navigator to make that trip. He was working with a ground compass only, uh, virtually using road maps if they existed at the time and, and landmarks. Reynolds died three months after completing his epic flight. His siblings used his inheritance to start the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, through which the family donated money for the new airport terminal. To design the building, Dick Reynolds hired Howard Cheney, the architect of the groundbreaking new terminal at Washington National Airport. Cheney sent his assistant, Ben Smith, to Winston-Salem. Charlie Norfleet never forgot what happened that day. Dick, Ben, and I went out to the airport. For some reason, carpenters were working there. After we showed Ben around, he picked up a plank and with a little pencil began to sketch a building on it. Well, Dick liked it very much, and I liked it very much. The next thing I knew, we were looking for a saw. Ben Smith sawed off the plank and stuck it in his briefcase and took it back to Washington with him. And it was really modeled after the one at Washington National Airport. Like the one at Washington National Airport, Smith Reynolds Airport Terminal had large windows so that you could sit in the lobby and look out and see planes landing and taking off. The new terminal incorporated the latest in airport design. Wide picture windows dominated the waiting area, allowing a clear view of the landing field. There were administrative offices, a ticket office, a weather room, a radio room, a control tower, and a baggage area. For passengers, there was a restaurant, a lunch counter, and upstairs, an elegant lounge called the Sky Club. The new terminal boasted numerous artistic touches. A portrait of Smith Reynolds hung over the marble fireplace in the Sky Club. The Sky Club also had a wooden mosaic map of the airport, complete with wind speed and wind direction indicators. Downstairs, the lobby was decorated with marble tablets, a large brass chandelier, and a bust of Smith Reynolds. In the restaurant, a gentle curving wall was covered with a 24-foot long mural depicting the growth of Winston-Salem over the decades. With the terminal financed by private money, not even World War II could hold up its completion. On June 13, 1942, 
the city gathered to dedicate the new terminal. Dick Reynolds, who had been elected mayor of Winston-Salem in 1941, presided over the festivities. This is a great day in the history of Winston-Salem, he said. It compares with the completion of the old plank road, the arrival of the first train, and the opening of the first paved highway. Smith Gambrell, the general counsel for Eastern Airlines, flew in from Atlanta to attend the ceremony. He told the crowd, this airport is literally a gym. No one can deny that this is the finest terminal in the United States. Eastern Airlines has found well justified its faith in Winston-Salem. The dedication ceremony concluded with the unveiling of the bust of Smith Reynolds. Around it, engraved in marble, were the accomplishments of his brief career. That evening, a private party was held in the Sky Club. It would be Dick Reynolds' final act in service to the airport. The next day, he resigned as mayor and joined the Navy. He would never live full-time in Winston-Salem again. Present in the audience that day was a 21-year-old man named Tom Davis. More than any other man, Davis would shape the airport's development over the next 40 years. He was the son of Egbert Davis, a close friend of R.J. Reynolds, and the president of Security Life and Trust. Like the Reynolds children, Davis was smitten with aviation and learned to fly as a teenager. Although he was considering a career as a surgeon, Davis worked part-time as a flight instructor while attending college in Arizona. In 1939, he returned to Winston-Salem. Mac McGinnis, his flight instructor, offered him a job at Camel City Flying Service selling airplanes. Camel City was struggling financially, and McGinnis had not yet repaid Dick Reynolds. With the encouragement of Reynolds and Charles Norfleet, Davis paid off the $14,000 debt and became the vice president, treasurer, and chief stockholder of the company. He and McGinnis renamed the company Piedmont Aviation. When I went to work there, Lewin S. McGinnis was president of Piedmont, and Tom Davis was vice president. And that changed about a year after I was there. Uh, Tom became president and Mac vice president. And McGinnis later left and went with Consolidated Ferries. Davis had a gift for business. Within a year, Piedmont opened 17 new dealer outlets for Piper and Stinson airplanes, and the company had sold 100 planes, more than any other dealer in the state. Next, Davis expanded Piedmont's repair facilities. Soon, Piedmont had the only federally certified aircraft and engine overall shop between Washington and Atlanta. The company's growth continued through World War II. Because of his asthma, Davis was excluded from military service, but the government needed pilots and had put his company to work training flyers for the Army Air Corps. In all, more than 1,000 pilots would learn to fly at Smith Reynolds during the war. We were teaching both the primary, cross-country acrobatics and instructors. I had probably about 60 students there at the time. Piedmont had leased the two floors in the YMCA and operated the restaurant there for the students and the flight instructors lived there also. And they had a bus that they trucked them to the airport and they also had a military training guy. Sometimes he'd march them to the airport. Had part of the training they had to take military on it. He'd heist them out of the room and march all the way down Liberty Street to the airport. <laughs> He'd get, get that done about once a week. He wouldn't let him ride a bus. With the end of the war, Smith Reynolds Airport again focused on commercial aviation. Eastern Airlines continued to provide scheduled service. In 1947, it was joined by Capital Airlines, a predecessor to United. But Tom Davis saw an opportunity. Davis applied to start a local service airline offering passenger, cargo, and airmail service to smaller cities that were not served by the established airlines. He hired 12 pilots home from the war and bought three DC-3s. The airline carried its first paying passenger on February 20th, 1948. Piedmont's business model was a success, and as the airline grew, so too did its use of Smith Reynolds Airport. 
It built new hangars and repair facilities to service its growing fleet of airplanes. When it ran out of room, it expanded across Liberty Street. Well into the 1950s, Winston-Salem could boast of having the best airport in North Carolina. But by passenger counts, it was not keeping up. For that period right after the war, the facts were that Greensboro High Point always had at least twice as many passengers as Smith Reynolds Airport. And so, despite the fact that Winston-Salem had the, the best commercial airport in the state, it couldn't compete with Greensboro High Point. Greensboro High Point just had a better location. However, the airport was becoming an important part of the local economy. By the mid-50s, Piedmont operated 16 airlines and employed more than 800 people. Its general aviation business and service and repair was booming. The airport might not be serving the most passengers, but it was a busy place thanks to the many private aircraft that flew in for repairs. The 1960s would be the boom years for Smith Reynolds. The airport began the decade with expansion of the north wing of the terminal to make room for more offices. The next year, the road leading to the terminal was renamed Norfleet Drive to honor Charles Norfleet for his years of service to the airport. Smith Reynolds Airport was averaging well over 100,000 takeoffs and landings a year. In 1961, it was the busiest in North Carolina, with more takeoffs and landings than any other airport in the state. It would repeat this distinction in 1963, 64, 67, and 69. Revenue was up. Times were good. In 1966, Piedmont and the county joined forces to expand the airport yet again. Piedmont had far outgrown its existing facilities, and it was about to take delivery of its first jet. As Piedmont Airlines grew, the airport grew because Piedmont needed hangars, they needed maintenance facilities, so they would, they would update their operation, and, and that definitely benefited the airport over the years. Throughout the 70s, Piedmont continued to grow but Smith Reynolds Airport was feeling the effects of reduced passenger counts. Winston-Salem had lost its battle with the Greensboro Airport. As early as the 1920s, the issue of having a single airport serve the triad had been proposed. Instead, the area ended up with two competing airports. This competition resumed after World War II, and in 1956, Friendship Airport began lobbying for a consolidation of all commercial air traffic at its field. A committee representing all three Triad cities hired a consultant who recommended construction of a new airport equal distance from all three cities. With no money for the project, the report gathered dust. Greensboro, with its higher passenger counts, resumed its efforts for consolidation. In 1960, the Civil Aeronautics Board ruled that National Airlines would only use one airport in the Piedmont Triad, and that airport would be Friendship. That was a significant turning point because that was really putting into a regulation that was going to be enforced uh, what really had been developing over several years. Piedmont, as a feeder airline, continued serving Smith Reynolds Airport, but the die had been cast. As Piedmont's operations grew and it moved to jet airliners, it gradually became less profitable to serve Smith Reynolds Airport. By 1969, a Piedmont consultant was suggesting that all flights be moved to Greensboro. In 1982, the Greensboro Airport completed a $65 million expansion. Shortly afterwards, Piedmont faced the inevitable and consolidated its operations at Greensboro. City leaders were not surprised. We have wondered when Piedmont would leave, said Neil Bettinger, Forsyth County Commissioner. It's been a slow, steady move. Old Piedmont has finally outgrown its birthplace. In the late 1970s, following deregulation of the airlines, Piedmont adopted the hub system that is used today by every major airline. The new system would bring tremendous growth to those airports used as hubs. The rest would be left to get along as best they could. Smith Reynolds, as the home airport for a major aviation company, 
would stay busy even though it would never again serve a significant number of passengers. During these years, the terminal was undergoing changes. With the expansion of the terminal in 1960, the Sky Club was closed and converted for use as a meeting and classroom. In the early 1970s, a small one-story addition was built on the field side of the terminal, blocking the picture windows. A stained glass window was installed high in the terminal over what was left of the picture window. In 1984, the interior of the terminal was rebuilt. The chandelier was taken down and given away. The interior walls were reconstructed and the marble tablet in the lobby was removed. Three years later, the restaurant closed for lack of business. The mural was later restored and moved to the lobby. Today, the restaurant is used as a storage room. The outlines of the lunch counter remain clearly visible on the floor. In the Sky Club, the fireplace and mosaic were covered up and the space was divided into offices. In 1993, stucco was applied to the exterior to cover cracking bricks and give the building a fresh look. Following the merger of Piedmont with US Air in January 1989, the pace of operations at the airport decreased. Eventually, most of the airline maintenance was moved elsewhere, leaving only the landing gear shop and a plating facility. In 1993, the airport started a new tradition that again has given citizens reason to visit. Every September, crowds gather for the annual air show. The show features stunt pilots and flyovers of the latest military jets. Static displays allow the public to get a close-up look at the airplanes. Well, I think the air shows are very important for the airport. As a matter of fact, that's one of the best things the airport does now. It's important for any airport to have some kind of attractions that draw people. And, uh, and, and Winston-Salem, since it's not drawing people for passengers, uh, I think the annual air show is a great way to bring people to the airport and, and really provide a service that uh, the other major airports probably could not provide simply because they have so much passenger service. And uh, Dale, that looks like Pat is driving the In September 2003, a recreation of the Ford National Air Tour was staged to celebrate the centennial of flight. The tour recreated the 1932 tour, which was canceled with the onset of the Great Depression. Winston-Salem, with one of the nation's premier airports at the time, was on the 1932 itinerary. 71 years later, 25 rare and vintage airplanes all of which participated in the original air tours, finally touched down in Winston-Salem. For a day, the landing field originally known as Miller Municipal Airport regained its lost prestige. Miller Municipal Airport was established during the decade when Winston-Salem reached its zenith as the leading city in North Carolina. But by the time the airport took its present name and shape in 1942, the city was being eclipsed by other metropolitan areas in the state. Nonetheless, the airport remains a visible symbol of civic foresight and determination. It is a monument built of brick and mortar to the civic leaders who recognized the importance of this emerging form of transportation. These leaders endowed Winston-Salem with a remarkable airport well ahead of its time. Their accomplishment ultimately would be overwhelmed by the larger forces shaping aviation, but this in no way diminishes their achievement nor the debt of gratitude all city residents owe to them. Their airport nurtured the rise of a major national airline that left its mark on the city. It has been a tool that has assisted in the growth of other corporations in town. And over the years, 
It has provided paychecks for thousands of families. Today, it has come full circle. It is, as it was in the beginning, a catalyst for dreamers of all ages. And the words of Charlie Norfleet, written in 1942, still ring true today. The new flying center means much more to the city than just an ordinary airport. It is fundamentally the people's answer to the challenge of modern transportation. And into it have gone not merely Winston-Salem ideas and Winston-Salem money, but the hopes and the struggles of men determined to build well for their home city and its future.